Hi, I'm just gonna add Angela. How do I do that? Oh, here it is. So today we're gonna talk about polycystic ovaries and how it relates to fertility when Angela joins. Hi, Angela, you have to join on here. This is this awkward moment at the beginning. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I was like, oh God, not not gonna have that like little time at the beginning on my own again. No, I, it always happens with Instagram. I don't think they've managed to uh, to work that glitch out yet. And you always end up treading water and kind of talking talking through things as people come along and join. So I hope you've not been alone too long. <laughs> no, it's fine. And I actually have some things written down because I had some questions, but because like, I just thought that we really need to separate out what we're doing because um, we both have so much to, to give. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like we're, you know, sort of traveling, traveling um, health people going around like we've got so much to give. <laughs> well, I just think, you know, this is a big thing. I, I, I think, like I keep saying, the fertility stuff is coming up a lot, particularly with lockdown. Yes. And, and I think that people can really do a lot to help themselves if they are suffering with specific conditions, because that will then lay the groundwork for them to to not have as many issues with their pregnancies. Yeah, absolutely. And I think PCOS is already a condition that can lead to other things in pregnancy, like, for instance, gestational diabetes. So we've got to be really, really mindful to lay the groundwork before we get to a point where, you know, something's going wrong metabolically in the body in pregnancy and there's not much you can do, you know, to pull that back once it's got there. It's a lot more kind of patching up and trying to sort things out, isn't it? And also the early fetal androgen exposure being a big yes, factor. Yes, absolutely. If it's a girl in particular as well, there's, there's that kind of genetic link which gets passed on to them later on in life in terms of them actually, you know, getting PCOS as well. And I see this in families so much when it's the mum has issues and the daughters. Um, and like the other things, so like thinking about the risk factors and the SNPs. We were saying like there's not that many SNPs that you would think about specifically for polycystic ovarian syndrome. No, I guess it's probably around um, the insulin sensitivity. So mm. there's the FTO SNPs as well, you know, which relate to the BMI side of things. Um, there's the VDR, um, you know, which that makes sense because a lot of people with PCOS generally have issues with vitamin D as well. Um, yeah, and also the aromatase. Yes, absolutely. And there's also PPARG as well, which relates to insulin and energy management as well, which, you know, which is a big thing in pregnancy anyway, because you lose so much energy, um, you know, trying to build a baby or build, build a new human being. So imagine if you have that plus all of those other genes as well. But also the, um, you know, the genetic predisposition to be able to favorably make more omega-3s when you're sharing the same enzymes. Yeah. I think that's a massive factor because that's going to really push an inflammatory picture if you don't, um, A, if you don't get enough omega-3, yeah. B, if you um, don't get enough of the nutrient cofactors, you need to shift that down the pathway yeah absolutely and i think um oscar Celerac has done a brilliant book on that looking at postnatal depletion and the amount of omega-3 that's needed in a normal pregnancy that doesn't have you know a potential for metabolic things to go wrong like they've already got pcos so we're talking you know people aren't having enough of that generally and if no. you have pcos what happens you know there in terms of your clinical um diagnosis and what can go wrong in pregnancy you you know you're in a precarious situation in pregnancy anyway so just making sure that you check that through with your functional practitioner and make sure you're on the right pathway with that um you know and, and listening to them as well you know it's one of those things that i generally tend to be really really mindful of in pregnancy that mm. people keep up with their omega-3s because it gets stolen from their own brain you know that of baby course. brain <laughs> and then baby steals everything it needs but it um, does but i think what a lot what a lot of practitioners i i think don't realize is that if you don't you have to balance out the omegas with the gla 
Yes, yes, and absolutely. If you, take, if you take too much, like omega-3 without considering the GLA, then you are going to end up having uh, depletions, um, which is why I always use products like the Apex fish oil that has the GLA built into it. Yeah, Nordic also has one as well. That's a, a great product. We're going to talk about supplements later. So we're yeah. jumping the gun there with supplements, aren't we? But, but I, I'm sure when we're going to be talking, we'll be overlapping with a lot of these kind of areas as well. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, loving the red lipstick, Carolina. Very oh, it's, nice. It's the only way I can feel like lockdown is not existing. Oh, I know. And I apologise oh. for the boiler. It's, it's, it's making booming noises. I can't hear anything. Um, I've got my dehumidifier on at the moment, so it sounds like a combine harvester in here. So if anyone can hear that, <laughs> it's uh, it's all round nutritional therapists and functional medicine weird stuff that we do. So uh, bear yeah, with us. Things. So um, actually, we'll talk about environmental toxins as well. Yeah, we will. Um, we will. Should we, so start, should we kick off about family history? I think that's the first thing that, you know, is, is something that both of us do, really, isn't it? And, yeah. and when somebody walks through the door, just what would you do, Carolina, if somebody came to you and said, I have a diagnosis of PCOS, um, and I need some help because I'm trying to get pregnant. Um, would you I mean, consider the family history? Would you see that as a big factor? Of um, so not just family history, but looking at someone's features, shape, everything, mm -hmm. endobiogenically, even the curve of the eyelashes is important. <laughs> is the left or the right boob bigger than the other? Because that- Oh will... my goodness. This is <laughs> taking things in a whole different light from me. So, so it's, it's uh, not know, this just, is where so you that... move it up. So that's why, you know, sorry, my, my screen keeps going dark. Um, so even just physical observation, I get so much mm. out of even talking to someone, like anyone. Um, yeah. and, and I love, I, that's why I loved in my endobiogenic classes is we would look at uh, art and like endobiogenically analyze people in the, in, in the pictures. But um, definitely always asking mm. about... Um, Family history, you know, what's going on with grandparents, where are they, what's your heritage as well, because that has yeah. a big impact. We were talking about the, you know, feast, famine, um, civilizations. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm Greek, so I'm like number one candidate for PCOS, which is why I'm kind of amazed I don't have it. Yeah, sure. Well, I think I've got elements of it. So, you know, I've got a lot of those genes mentioned there. Um, and I've got a family history of insulin sensitivity. My grandma had glycoma. My dad has it. I've got, you know, elements of that. So it's all about how we can kind of mitigate for some of these things. Um, yeah, I think when you say genes, you've got the genes, we've all got the genes. It's whether you have yeah. the SNPs in the genes and whether you actually epigenetically mm. express them. Because, frankly, we both do a lot of work on not expressing those mm. genes. Yeah. It's the so. sleeper cell, isn't it, situation, isn't it? It's there, but it's ready to be activated. You know, if we become, as I like to use my favourite phrase, a salad dodger or try lots of different things that may actually target that. So, you know, it's, it's very important to look after yourself. And I think, you know, one of the best things we can do is go and see somebody like, you know, either of us, if we are going to be looking into starting a family. Um, you know, we have all these people and I saw one of my colleagues actually see a really interesting post the other day saying, you know, plumber, um, have a problem wrong with your pipes, go and see a plumber, mm -hmm. you know, electrician, your lights have gone off, um, car needs an MOT. And then it said, a, then it showed a squiggly line going loads of different areas before you go and see a nutritionist or a nutritional therapist or even somebody who's functional medicine. For some reason, people think that going online working with dr google and trying to find this all out through forums is going to be a really good idea and i guess because fertility is so taboo people don't really want to go let's go and see somebody to help with this um we're told that you can just make a baby easily as soon as you get with somebody or even if you're not with somebody you know going down that whole route on your own that it's going to happen magically and it's you know been we've been stopped doing that from teenage years and told if you even sit next to a guy in a, in a class or, you know, you yeah. want to get pregnant, it's going to happen. So it's a real <laughs> shock to most people, but it doesn't when we start that whole process. Sex education at school was really scary. Oh, it's dreadful, isn't it? It, it totally needs a, a, a rethink massively. 
Um, I hope it's better now than when I was younger. It was absolutely pants. I don't know about you, but do you remember the tampon in, I mean... in the test tube? You know, what What did that do? That was absolute crap, wasn't it? I mean, I, I, I've got to say that it took a long time for me to understand what a test tube baby was because nobody explained yes. what that meant. What, what on earth was that? Why did they call them that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Horrible uh, expression sex education as well. sucked, didn't it? In in the uh the eighties and nineties. <laughs> I mean yeah. And I mean I went to school in England when I had my sex ed, so I don't I can't even imagine how awful it would have been in Malaysia. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Well mine was in Hong Kong and it was in a, a forces school, so you know, it is probably a lot better now, but it was absolute crap. Um, and even the girls were taken away, you know, separately to talk about periods, you know, so oh I'm a little bit older than you, Carolina. So it was still much more taboo. So I think that's where it all starts. And sadly, they don't think at that stage, maybe if there's an issue with my hormones, I need to go and speak to somebody who can help me with that. You know, somebody who has a background in functional medicine or nutritional therapies or people who understands you know how to work through functional testing you know that's yeah. that's where we all start the other thing i find very interesting is the idea of that the irregular periods are normal oh, so yeah. um mm. you know i've been asked before by parents but you know, why does it matter that my you know that my child has irregular periods i'm like well mm. so there's two ways of looking at this i think sorry this keeps being weird um one is were they ever regular and did they then mm. become irregular yeah Two, like were they irregular the whole way through from the start have and and actually there's an argument now that if they're always irregular from the start yes i know that you can have a, a year or two like odd mm. odd timings but really it should regulate after a, a couple of years and if it doesn't then i would really start to think about doing further investigation and the problem is people don't want to put their kids through that stuff and yeah. lots of girls are, are expressing uh P, um, PCOS type symptoms much earlier now but mm. their parents don't want to end up putting them on restrictive diets or kind of cutting out foods and I kind of there's an element of that I agree with I think it's mm. really unhealthy in this day and age with Instagram to be removing loads of foods from someone's diet if they're mm. going to then end up having um, disordered eating issues so yeah. like it's such a conundrum like we want to get their hormones regular we want to get mm. things you know reduce the chronic disease risk later because we know that P pcos is linked with kind of the development of triple negative breast cancer and other you know me metabolic issues so you know how do you navigate for example if you're working with someone younger i mean we're not dealing with fertility and pcos generally with children with, with 17 mm. or 18 year olds but um you know you do have to to to, to say you know the message is actually this will affect your fertility later yeah. So we need to nip it in the bud now. And going on the pill, frankly, I don't think is the solution. Oh, my um, God. It's the worst solution, isn't it? Um, I mean, I was lucky because my mum was never on the pill and did, it didn't occur to her to kind of send me to have anything like that. So well, I was at boarding school, so I was just yeah. shoved on a, you know, I remember having irregular periods, you know, when you're bleeding you know, consistently. And I remember being mm. the nurse putting me on the, the, the pill when I was 14. Yeah, oh, that's and right. I was like relieved, frankly, that I was getting those breaks because I didn't have to go to swimming. Yeah. yeah, well, it's kind of the masculinization of you know of females, really, isn't it? You know, because med men generally tend to dominate medicine, putting yeah. women in that category and saying let's turn periods off, let's turn pain off, let's not look into it. It's such an interesting factor, isn't it? Because women from a very early age are saying periods are a pain; they're problematic let's not fix them, let's just stop them, you know, or let's change them. So that message is already coming out that we can turn things on and off when we feel like it. And also, I, I love the fact that the, the reason the bleed is even there is because of the Pope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's make it, let's make a pretend period so that like religion can get to grips with it. Well, well the idea of pushing packs, I think is so unhealthy. Yeah. So, I mean, I was, I, I was told to do that in my, in my early, in my late teens when I was on that time on the combined pill. I mean, all these things I wish I'd known about mm -hmm. then that I didn't know. Yeah, I know. And uh, the nutrient deficiencies as well that come along with that. So, you know, and, and if we talk about it in relation to PCOS, if there's a slight chance that maybe there's an issue with, you know, that communication system 
from the brain to the ovaries when you're put on the pill it's almost like you know the machinery stops working that communication stops working and that's been identified as one of those things that you know it, we're so delicate i think in terms of that communication system Absolutely. that it can sometimes take a year for that to come back you know when people are generally told go on it and come off it when you have a baby and i've had people who've taken two years to actually get a period back after coming off the pill and they've they called it pill induced pcos well, you should send, like that's what i do i get people's a lot yeah. of what I do is getting people's periods to come back after a long time. Mm. I also yeah. am known for my moving periods for weddings. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I think it's it, it's so interesting. This whole thing starts from, you know, as soon as your period arrives to mm. kind of when we want to have babies. There's that whole gap. Let's turn things off. Let's turn them back on again and hope that, you know, everything comes back. For some women, it's it does because you know they're quite lucky like that but for other people it can actually induce that whole situation and then they go down that route of investigation and what's happening and i think at that stage it's just there is there is definitely what i call pcos on the spectrum but Absolutely. it's where you fall on that in terms of how strong that that pill had an effect on you and how long that's going to take for it to actually get back into its rhythm again really and that's that, that, honestly that's the best reason to use herbs to try and really like make your body like respond in a way so like you know you can use herbs like um what is it in english alcamilla ladies mantle mm. uh yarrow things that will kind of you know stimulate the loose nose and get that kind of corpus luteum to like movers and shakers <laughs> exactly things that will actually shift things but also that will have an impact on liver metabolism and yeah. You know, herbs that will, you know, herbs like, like Kohosh and um, Chattavari, which act like kind of, they have those kind of triterpenoid steroid or saponins, which kind of have that hormonal mimic effect without actually overriding hormonal function, yeah. but that make your body gently think something's going on. So it kind of starts mm. to stimulate the, the regulation and the pattern. Well, it's interesting hearing you talking about herbs, Caroline, because obviously I know you and I talk to you a lot about this, but there's so many nutritional therapists out there that use and dabble with herbs and can get it really wrong. And I'm always a little bit cautious about this. And obviously I've been interested in herbs for a while and I always kind of refer to you. And I think most nutritional therapists should work with a herbalist or at least have conversations before they're recommending some of these things, because, you know, you can't mess around with herbs in terms no. of how things are working. <laughs> The other thing that I find very interesting is people just using supplements when they don't know that the, the herb should be used in a specific form for that person. Mm -hmm. So, it's, and also it's all about harmonizing the formula. So you're not just dealing with the actual hormonal element, you're dealing with the other underlying factors you're seeing. Are there gut microbiome biotransformation yeah. issues? Mm -hmm. Because if there are, you need to address that. Yeah. Are you dealing with a ton of, uh, bile what's deconjugating bacteria in the gut that are just going to really wipe out all of the liver cologogs uh, and the cologogs you give and then you're going to make them feel worse really yeah. break out their skin mm. um good old I, milk thistle which is what they chuck in all the time and that generally uh, isn't great isn't it because we've got to look at how the pathways of the liver are working and if if they're not if they're you know problematic in one phase and then and fast or slow in another then it's always well, worth kind of looking into that, really. And that's where I, a herb can kind of help. I would say milk thistle, though, because it's a hepatoprotective and a recycler. It's not necessarily like I would not consider that like a liver liver herb, like you know, mm. yarrow or, um, God, bupleurum, which is a massive like liver dredger. can really mm. make loads of emotional stuff happen. <laughs> um, kind of an amazing herb, actually. Uh, mm. And it's very good for the, 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 the rona. I'm mm. kind of nervous <laughs> to say the name of the, the thing. Yeah, the thing uh, we must not speak. <laughs> uh, also, I'm like in denial. I just want it to go. If we don't talk about it, then maybe it will just go back to where it is. Yeah, maybe. It, maybe. It it's a bit like Voldemort, isn't it? Don't, don't speak its name. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get these Harry Potter references. I've never seen it. You've never seen Harry Potter? What? I know, I tried, but it was just so childish. <laughs> and I haven't read the books. I'm too old for this now. Um, so let's think about like the the kind of overview of why 
the kind of things that are happening with polycystic ovarian syndrome, the big areas that we would really need to address in terms of you know, androgens, adaptogens for adrenal support, what's going on with blood sugar. Like, mm. what, how do you look at it when you look at someone? Because we obviously, we look at the family history, we look at their childhood history, we look at their mm. gut health the whole way through. We look at everything, actually. We look at trauma. We look at, um, I always ask about environmental toxins, where people lived. And if they're like, yeah. oh, I live in the country. And then they've got like two people in their, in their vicinity who have autoimmune disease. I'm like looking up mm. to see if there's ever been any chemical spills, what factories yeah. are around them, are they near main roads? Well, um, yeah, there's a lot of spraying going on in the country if they live near rapeseed fields and all sorts, don't they? Exactly. So, that's and how many how many thyroid patients do you see who grew up on a farm and were exposed yeah. to pesticides? Oh, yes, yeah, so absolutely. many. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't automatically mean you're uber healthy if you live in the country because you may live near you know a massive agricultural you know farm that sprays constantly. Or well, your farmhouse might be mouldy. Yes, exactly. So it that's is a lot of things in there. It's, it's again, it's the same as anything, really, Caroline. If you've got somebody that walks through the door, everybody's an individual, and there could be just one or two things that are slightly different from that that tick them over the balance. Of course. Really. So that's why I me, hate it's protocols. all is, exactly. It's not a protocol, and I always spend so much time with clients, and I spend a lot of time going through things because. To be honest with you, I don't see classic PCOS very often. No. Um, you know, overweight, um, you know, hirsutism, hair loss, spots, um, and acne, cystic acne. Um, even the kind of approach they do, the Rotterdam criteria, yeah. doesn't necessarily apply to the people, but they may have at one point have had cystic um, uh, polycystic ovaries on that, and then another time it hasn't. So... I think it's more about that push pull about what is happening with them at the moment and what are we treating and supporting at this point. So they may, and to look deeper into that, we need to do some functional testing and look at them as a personal person, you know, and they could be more on the androgen side. Um, and then there's going to be a different approach to that. And then looking at their bloods as well to get that kind of confirmation, because there's lots of different tests we can run yeah. after that. But for me, one of the most important tests to run really is the blood test to mm. kind of get the whole picture to begin with, to see where they fall on that spectrum. You okay. know, if they haven't got high levels of testosterone, but yet they've got a higher level of luteinizing hormone, you know, what's going on there? Where's the testosterone going? You know, looking at the sex hormone binding globulin, what's happening there? Um, you know, also, you've got their FSH it. is high as well, you know, or low. SHBG and thyroid that can add another mm. that can miss that can kind of cloud things a bit yeah and they're also full thyroid as well so a lot of people who have PCOS also will have other inflammatory conditions as well so the, the thyroid is key you know you always need to look at that alongside all of that and then you know running a full blood count as well and looking at you know cholesterol and lipids and trying to yeah. look at you know where the liver enzymes are working to see if there's an issue with that I mean it's it's literally like, you know, a Ferrari. And I always use this analysis. I think women are like Ferraris and they need a team of people to fine tune things all the time and test, rechange the oil, look at all sorts of things. I hate to use the analogy of women as cars, but I think <laughs> in terms of the, uh, the whole picture, we've got to be looking at blood first and then we kind of go from there and see what is happening right here, right now in their, their general presentation. And, you know, I know you do that as well, Caroline, and it's such a, yeah. you know, a long list of things that you do, which makes me cry when I see tests from the NHS and they've got FSH, estradiol. And, I know. You know, if they lucky, haven't even checked vitamin D. And it's like, no, absolutely. And they go, oh, month. I've had all my tests done. Everything's fine. They just said, you know, I probably still have PCOS, but they didn't do a scan to check, you know, and they come to us and, and you know, get the full treatment really don't they in terms of let's find out what's going on and I mean, it's such an interesting kind of approach to things and I geek out every time you know I spend so much time looking into their in individual situation but the blood can give us so much um to go on and I think from there we can kind of look at loads of other things if you have all of this stuff already 
where you've asked them to do lots of things where you suspected there's other things there great but i think start off with the blood and, and you can kind of go from there really it's it's the beginning of the race really yeah and i do my biology of functions as well because that gives me really in-depth understanding of kind of tissular level androgenic estrogenic activity um and, and i think i know that lot, not a lot of people run osteocalcin but i may jump and put it on fdx <laughs> Um, it's such an important marker for understanding estrogenic kind of bone activity, like calcium regulation, blood sugar regulation. And I tend to see actually that goes quite high when someone has PCOS. Mm. Um, then you run that through the, the things. But um, we do that. Have we had any questions Yeah, I can't see any comments. I haven't had any live questions, but I wrote no. down some things in my... Um, We've got a few people watching and it's, it's unusual at this stage that we don't have any questions coming through. I know we're kind of running through lots of different areas, but um, yeah, blood tests are great. What other tests would you say as well, Carolina, that you use generally when you, um, you see people on a regular basis and at what stage in that process would you kind of go for that? I mean, I, if someone doesn't come in with any bloods at all, because, mm. you know, I just think it's so important to have a, some element of an understanding of someone. You know, you can look yeah. really great, but you could be a complete, you know, not, not so great. I'm trying not to use negative language. Yeah. Um, <laughs> trying to use the French thing, fan language. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think stool tests are really important. Mm. And becoming, um, it, you know, so, you know, when you're really unimpressed with the labs and then, you know, finally you find some that work really well. And I really like the in vivo one at the moment. Um, yeah just added bile haven't they um, bile. yes I'm so excited about that I was like yeah absolutely and that's such an important thing I think now getting into that because you might be okay on a lot of things but if you're stagnating the bile and that's problematic you can't get rid of you know excess toxins and you know conjugate your fat get rid of all that and you're in you're in sort of you know a difficult situation so we've got to look at things in stages you know, and unblocking those things to let things flow at each stage and allowing those stop gaps to open at the right time. So, you know, it's almost like an orchestra trying to get the right things coming in at the right time so that the whole symphony can actually play really well. Oh, there's, there's three questions come up now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't uh, see the questions. Okay, what is good for low energy levels with PCOS? Um, so I would, I would also try and understand why like what are the drivers for your pcos um mm. because i wouldn't just slap you with uh you know energizing adaptogens <laughs> are you are you dealing with mitochondrial function like dysfunction mm. are you actually able to make energy properly are there any nutrient deficiencies do you have enough carnitine b vitamins magnesium and then i'd figure out what to give you but i i wouldn't be able to like you know generally if someone's tired you've got to understand why mm. they're tired um, yeah. And the first thing, actually, the foundational thing you need to, to look at is blood sugar regulation, right? Mm. Fibre, mm. adding fibre to meals makes a big difference. Digestive enzymes, like really yeah. basic stuff. Absolutely. And I think that that is king when you're coming, or queen even, when you're coming to the whole situation. If your blood sugar is out of balance, that will tip you into a higher side of the spectrum of PCOS. And if you can bring that back down with fibre, and making sure you're having enough vegetables and protein um, going forward, that's really going to start the whole process rolling and get things in a better place. And then it will be that first stage. And from there, we look at other things as well. So I think for me, that, that is such an important thing to get under control because a lot of ladies come in with PCOS, they may not have the classic kind of overweight PCOS. No, I, I very rarely <laughs> see a classic No, I, I'm the same. I'm the same. It's, it's quite an unusual setup now. Um, you know with that and going into the NHS and having you know BMI talks from the nurse and things like that that doesn't really go any further does it because there's not really much advice coming from that situation so for I mean, me it's always what what's happening with them let's look into this deeper it it almost confounds people in the UK on the NHS when people come in and they're slim and they have regular periods and they they have a diagnosis of PCOS, they don't know what to do with no, it. No, they do. They put them on a the pill. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Which is against what we're trying to do. I know, but that's yeah. I'm saying that's not a solution. Uh, no. Someone says that RSH, 
I'm struggling with finding out my ovulation dates. I've tried many things like strips over. Is there anything you recommend? Oh, yes. I can ask that one. Answer that one. So I generally tend to, and I have been since about 2015, been using the Ovisense. I use that myself as well because I'm 47 and it's useful for me to gauge how close I am to the menopause and what's happening with my um, hormones. But with my clients, I think it really gives us an idea of what's happening in the cycle. You know, what's what the stress levels are like can also be in, in, indicative from using this particular fertility monitor. You wear it internally and what it does is give you a core cool body temperature. Um, I'm always sending these on to Carolina and saying, give me some herbs. I'm yeah, yeah. she, she this... sends me screenshots every month of her, of her <laughs> and ovulation And what you need to do there is just look at how we're working with um, the cycles. If we've got you know, some issues in the luteal phase in particular, um, look back to the follicular phase. Is there a problem there? Because if you're not making the right hormones in the first stage of your cycle, the second stage is going to be problematic. You can't just go in there, like Carolina said, whack in some things to help with energy or blood sugar or whatever, and hope it's going to work. You've actually got to start building it from the start so that we can gather moths and, and improve that situation. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest issue some clients have when they come in is that they get really impatient. They're like, why aren't you dealing with this? I'm like, I have to do the foundational work first or like, yeah. it's just all a waste of time. Sure. And I think sometimes you're wasting, you know, money on them and giving, you know, lots of different tests and whatever. But I think just for us to get a pure picture of that so we can kind of pull the threads together and understand what pattern we're working with with, with them and then make it work for them. So it becomes a much more tailored approach to things than saying, here, have some fish oils, here, have a prenatal. Um, let's hope for the best. Oh, you've got skin problems. Let's give you some zinc. You know, any old nutritional therapist can do that. But what we do, and I think, you know, what decent nutritional therapists and people who practice functional medicine is they look at the tests, they recommend things based on what you've told them, symptoms and some of those yeah. things that are coming up in, in those results. And we act on that and hopefully unblock some of those issues so that things can start to flow better. The most dreadful thing I saw last week was someone had literally been given like about 10 supplements based on their Nutraval results because oh, it was no. like, you need 500 milligrams of this, 600 of that. I was like, and they literally had like all these supplements and I was like, you don't ever supplement like that based on a result, like ever. Mm. Um, yeah, it's like when you get... Um, you know, when you go through a genetic company and they recommend you take vitamin D because you've got vitamin D receptor issues or it's homozygous or whatever, you don't know whether that's presenting. It's like, I, I have it, that. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, and also, if someone's got MTHFR, you know, one of the genes. You know, yeah, people, that's the thing. Like, people talk about, like, a diagnosis and, like, can we eat this? Like, in those, and I'm just like, oh, my God. Like, you don't ever treat SNPs. No, you don't. You treat the person and whether they're actually expressing or whether there's symptoms. Um, and that's always a great practitioner will always look and listen to that person and try and sort of hear what they've got and also hear what's going on around them as well. You know, there may be some blockages in their lifestyle as well. Well, that's, the, that's another thing. Toxins aren't always chemicals. They can also be people. They certainly can, love. <laughs> And um, we so, had another question about bloods. What blood markers should we look at when we're going to do a, a complete blood test for going to the doctor? Uh, I can answer that. If you're mm. going to an NHS doctor, you can't ask for anything because they won't listen. Sorry, mm. you can answer. Yeah, so go to somebody who can run these blood panels for you and give you a full and comprehensive panel. So, you know, if you're working with a, a specific person like myself or Carolina, we've got a whole list of things that we can then add as a menu based on that particular presentation when they've come to you with a full questionnaire and we've gone through that thoroughly in the first session. Um, and every time you see us, we will then say, how are you feeling? Let's look at some of those kind of um, markers there in terms of your signs and symptoms. And then we run some more tests. We want to see patterns. And that's what another thing that drives me mad when someone says, you're going into the menopause when they've had a high FSH level, or we can't treat you um, at our fertility clinic because your FSH is 13. Um, that can also be something that um, can be affected by stress. You know, anything in the pituitary 
can affect those hormones and those other um other blood markers around it and we've got to look at those pituitary based hormones and see whether those are high as well to see whether it's actually coming from there so always have two to three tests done particularly for blood tests before you actually make a diagnosis on something don't just say oh you've got a high level of that i'm a bit worried about that i'm not sure what we can do um that's probably this situation you've got to have you know patterns we're going to be looking for patterns for things over a period of time yeah and also i i genuinely um have seen many times patients who've been told they're in the menopause and you know we do some work supporting the hormones and then their periods come back for two more years yeah i mean mm. um yeah I, i'm always like yeah let's see and you see a lot of like kind of things happen which can cause like an effect to temporary kind of menopause picture but that doesn't mean mm that the menopause has started there's a few questions coming through that are quite personal and i don't think we should be answering things like that um, i can't see the questions does it come up with me as well do, or do i um do i not see them i don't know um probably me it's probably mercury retrograde causing problems with the it situation yeah uh someone's asking about breastfeeding uh stopping breastfeeding because they want to conceive uh, yes, you you can technically conceive and breastfeed, but um, it's it's more difficult, I would say, because your body's suppressing that. Um, it depends. I mean, I I don't tend to find a lot of patients get pregnant if they're breastfeeding. No, uh, it depends. It's not it's evolutionarily not meant to happen anyway. Yeah, I mean, you can check things like prolactin. If your prolactin is still super high, that's going to be in some cases um you know problematic um and also just look at when you, your periods have come back again some people don't even have periods i had a client who was breastfeeding and you know her periods didn't come back for 18 months after she gave birth so you know don't assume that you can't get pregnant if your periods haven't come back but yeah it's more of a a likely situation that if you're breastfeeding and your periods haven't come back then it will be more difficult for you to actually get pregnant again but if you have had your periods I would then, you know, go and get a day three hormone test done and a thyroid test and just see what's happening there. Um, and if there's anything that needs some support there. Breastfeeding doesn't necessarily mean you can't get pregnant, but it's probably more likely when you stop breastfeeding. And I've had that in many clients. They've been trying while they've been breastfeeding. They've been breastfeeding up to, you know, two to three years with some of the, their... Um, yeah. Their, I have an issue with this actually. I don't think you should be breastfeeding and trying to conceive as a, like mm. that's my professional opinion because I don't mm. believe you are nutrient replete enough mm. to be breastfeeding and conceiving and becoming pregnant. And I just don't. Yeah, I think there's a lot of energy being taken obviously to produce the breast milk and everything else. And you, you do, I think, need a bit of time in between each pregnancy um for your bone health for your brain health like for me that's a, a massive factor have yeah. a break be a mom yeah absolutely um rebuild your resilience get on the adaptogens once you're there's some safe adaptogens you can take when you're breastfeeding but we're not covering that today no. um but you should have a period of rebuilding and resilience after mm. um and then endometriosis we're going to cover another time Okay, so, so someone's asking about insulin resistance and not being able to lose weight. Okay, so one thing I will say about metformin is that it creates a ton of nutrient depletions. Mm. So oh, it's terrible, isn't it? A lot of those metformin. run your mitochondrial function, and if you can't produce energy, like I don't really think that a lot of people can lose lose weight very easily. Um, which is why I would prefer people to try berberine. But again, that has its own yeah. long term. Nice I don't like people being on that long term. Mm. So I think there's a lot of things to consider when you have PCOS and you're struggling with weight loss um, and your insulin resistance. And it's not just a case of move more, which is the advice the doctors give. Yeah. Exercise more. It's like, well, there might be some environmental toxins interfering with your endocrine system. Um, mm. You know, thyroid is going to be impacted as well because the, you know, the way the hormones work is you've got the corticotrophic axis, which then feeds into the, you know, the sex hormones, which then feeds into the, the thyroid hormones, which then feeds into your growth hormones, your somatotrophic hormones. So 
um, you know, they're all linked. So if you have blocks in one, you're going to have a knock-on effect in the mm. others. It's often linked, isn't it? The thyroid and PCOS. And if people are having problems losing weight, it's probably more down to that combined factor there. Um, and the fact that there's, you know, metabolically your body is not working as efficiently as it should. Um, and there are so many things you can actually do to try and remedy that. But getting a full picture to begin with yeah. is always an important thing. It's not just a case of, I've been to the doctors, I can't lose weight, and I've got insulin resistance. Yeah, insulin resistance is the end result of what's been happening for a long period of time. And we need to investigate what the, the root causes of that are, really. Um, but like you said, it's all about, you know, your mitochondria there in, in a lot of cases and getting that working better again and more efficiently will then start burning a lot more energy and that will help support your thyroid too. But, but also uh, if your body's in a hypercortisol state, because yeah. of, it might not be emotional, it might be a physiological thing that you haven't mm. picked up, it might be your gut bacteria completely out of whack, it might be that your bile is yeah, uh, being it's <laughs> It could be... Uh, you know, local, like, you know, localized tissue um, inflammation. We don't, we don't know until we've seen the patient. So there's no hard and fast rule for how to lose weight with PCOS because not everything works for everyone. Yeah, it's, it's very individual, isn't it? And I think that's the beauty of getting a specialist involved that can, you know, really drill down and find out what's working and what may be needing a little bit of support. Um, by looking at these key um, key functions in the body. Philip is asking what you suggest as an alternative approach for clients when private testing is financially inaccessible. Well, that is usually the case sometimes with my patients because they've already paid to come and see me. Uh, my answer to that is just spend all your money on CPD and then you'll be a better practitioner and you won't need the tests. I, d I missed that then. You froze for a second. What I quite... said that um, when patients can't afford testing, I really think the responsibility is with the practitioner to be better at their job mm. and to be able to pick stuff up without necessarily having stuff in front of them. You know, just making people aware that if you don't have tests, then it might take longer because you won't have a, such a focused yeah. approach. But generally, if your knowledge is good, you can pick stuff up and you can get yeah. on the right track without the tests. And yeah. frankly, most of the time when you're testing, it's confirming what you already know. Yeah, absolutely. I'd still say a blood test is quite important. Oh, yeah, of course. But that's something we can all get from the GP. Like, yeah. We can, we can go and get, even if it's just the basic panel, I think yeah. that's, you know, and maybe, you know, we've got medi-checks and things like that now to make things quite cost effective. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's also making time for it as well and saying, you know, if my fertility is a priority, um, we need to put something aside for that to try and work out what it is you know because we can't just go i've only got money for the practitioner and nothing else um because yeah. you also have to go into it looking at potentially dietary changes lifestyle changes it's not going to be just paying for that practitioner's time it's like if you you know got a plumber out you would have to pay for his time and also you know the parts as well and you know the time um that he may have to come back and and revisit so it's exactly the same as it is in life, really. It's not just as cut and dry as the client can't afford the tests. There are ways around that in some cases, but like Carolina says, you, you definitely need to have a, an instinct about this and you know find out the full picture by um, asking them about themselves yeah. and their family health. You can also really spend a lot of time on questionnaires, like really make really targeted focused questionnaires that will ask, you know, will give you so much information. And that, that doesn't, I don't feel like that saves time, but it provides a much better picture. And there are some things you can't test anyway. Like neurotransmitters, you're going to get a peripheral picture, which doesn't tell you much about, about what's happening centrally. So having the right questionnaires, you can really figure that out. And stress, like, so the way I see it, you can work on your stress, you can do all of that, you can do your diet, you can do your supplements, but, and you can do the herbs, but one, one part isn't going to fix the problem. You need to really be, you, well, it might very slowly, but I genuinely think that, you know, having a full picture, doing as much as you can, you know, looking at different angles of how you can help yourself, you know, bringing in integrative therapies that are appropriate, you'll get a much quicker result. And when it comes to fertility, you're basically trying to correct something and you don't have a huge amount of time to do that because when you've already decided you want to have a baby, mm. you're kind of in that window. Yeah, 
You are. And I think this is the other thing. You're battling with the emotional side of things because they're saying, I can't have a child. I failed as a, as a woman. And you've got all that to deal with as well. And it's very taboo. You know, I've had so many clients say this, you know, all these new changes, they've had to lie about it going to their, you know, mother-in-law's house about changes to diet and, you know, not drinking and trying to be really good because they don't want people to know that these are things they're doing to try and get their hormones balanced and to get pregnant. So if you were on a normal um, and you went to see somebody, if you had a health condition, you'd be able to say that to them um, and say, this is the reason and explain it. So they've got all those kind of other issues emotionally to deal with, um, you know, yeah. and sometimes the partners are very reticent as well. So well, the you know, part partners generally don't think it's anything to do with no no and that's the problem the women are literally going 10 to the dozen saying whatever i can do i will do and then trying to get the partner or the husband if if they're in a couple together to make those changes can be really difficult so i think often if you are a practitioner it's good to maybe speak to the partner you know and try and get them involved um because they they probably would listen to you and and could ask some very valid questions which may not have come out beforehand yeah absolutely I, yeah I, I definitely think there needs to be better communication around the the work that you're doing um and you know why it's why it's important you know not like you know if, if a partner smokes like the well we know about the impact on sperm but also just smoking around someone who's who's genuinely really working hard on on preparing themselves for pregnancy and correcting their hormonal imbalances i just i have to always reiterate the idea you know the concept of third hand smoke but it doesn't seem to to sink in we had another question asking about the link between pcos and miscarriage well obviously because um you know getting pregnant with pcos can be um a lot more problematic in the first place there is a, a, a huge link with with miscarriage as well and you know holding the pregnancy so there's often issues in you know the first trimester because there's, there's pregnancy um, issues in the first place but the first trimester for often you know everybody is one of those very kind of scary times where things can happen but um, there is a you know a, a much higher percentage looking at you know some of the research around this that women with PCOS generally tend to miscarry more um, yeah. Whether that's to do with, um, you know, the formation of the, um, the placenta and the progesterone levels or something else. I mean, it can also be about, um, you know, insulin resistance and how that plays into the whole whole process of things. There's, there's a myriad of things really that can go wrong in the first trimester generally when you don't have PCOS. But I think um, with PCOS, that first trimester and then when you get onto the second trimester, if you can... Um, manage to get there with PCOS it's about managing your insulin resistance because that can then quite quickly move down to gestational diabetes which can be dangerous for for mum and baby as well um, but first trimester is that kind of really rocky period for people with PCOS um, and I think that can be managed very much by diet and lifestyle um, and so there's herbs for that but not and not herbs I'm going to disclose on here because it's like one of those things where if you're giving someone herbs in the first trimester you absolutely mustn't be a, a nutritionist trying to no, you've got to be a herbalist and know exactly what you're doing really on that yeah. side um so. but there is I, I totally agree that there is a a much um more riskier pregnancy in the first trimester if you have pcos mm. um and that's that's very well researched and it can be because, um, you know, of, of all sorts of things, really. And it's, again, going back to working with that individual and speaking to them and asking them about, you know, whether there's a family history of, of fertility issues, miscarriage, and also trying to work through what their lifestyle is. Um, and when you actually get pregnant, um, maintaining that pregnancy by the right means. It could be, you know, that there may be a potential for um, higher blood clotting, um, yeah. if you're overweight or if there is a cardiovascular issue or if that's in the family. Um, and again, if that's around the time that placenta is forming around sort of, you know, six to eight weeks, that can be an issue there. So it's about, you know, working with a um, obstetrician and somebody who can help you 
um, through that, that early stage in the pregnancy up to the second trimester. Um, and also looking at your progesterone levels as well, because often people with PCOS have a really hard time making good levels yeah. of progesterone. Um, and, you know, seeing if you can get that from your doctor or also working with a practitioner to help build that. And obviously there's some herbs that can help support that and, and, and manage that. But obviously it's yeah. making sure you've got it right. The most, I think the most abused herb is Vitex. Everyone just takes yeah. that. Um, mm. there are, like, it's better to use Vitex with other things. And there are specific times of the day you should be taking Vitex. But I really like, like Peony is one of my favorite herbs for, for mm. that. Um, yeah, there's a few. Um, I was just thinking about the whole concept of insulin resistance and why it even happens. Mm. So the whole reason your cells become insulin resistant is because they're desperately trying to get nutrients into the cells. So yeah. what's going on with the cellular metabolism of nutrients? So it literally boils down to the cellular level. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's about banking, you know, that insulin and pulling it out as well. It's that whole process of going in and coming out, really. So um, I think that's an interesting concept because a lot of people do have some issues with that. Um, you know, it's about liver again and supporting that. Yeah, so again, like turmeric's a really, really good one for PCS people because it's 5 alpha mm. reductase inhibitor. Um, yeah. yeah, and turmeric I think... and reishi. Yeah, reishi. Ah, oh, interesting. And also, mm. if you think about reishi and how it affects histamine and how histamine increases with estrogen, yeah. which is why so many women get much worse kind of histamine symptoms as their estrogen levels are beginning to rise. Um, yeah, you can absolutely. nip many things, and well, you can nail. What's the word? Catch two birds with one stone. That's I always get expression. as well, but then I've got dyslexia, so I'm always getting my sayings wrong. Hit two birds. I mean, it's so like the idea of hitting animals. No, um, it's a, bit of a horrible one. It's like saying I'd, I could eat a scabby donkey as well. If you're British, that's horrible. In, in Cyprus, you don't say "I curse you." You say "I hope your intestines turn back and fall out." That's what old women say to you on the street. Nice. <laughs> It's like you can't keep it chill. It has to be really brutal. That's like Hong Kong. They've got a really flowery way of telling you to get lost, which I won't tell you, but um, you probably know anyway. Um, I don't remember. Everything is, is a lot more flowery, I think, in, in other places. I think the UK just have odd words that they just kind of spew out to insult people. But um, yeah, the only I think word I remember from Hong Kong to... is Lucasay. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. They, lo they love this sweet stuff there. But then, you know, I think China generally they don't tend to have as many issues with PCOS and we can talk about that in terms of nationality. Which is incredible considering the toxins in the air. I have so many yeah. Bredesen patients in China. Yeah, I know, surprisingly. But, I mean, there is, there is a kind of uh, predisposition to different, um, different sort of um, people all over the globe that have different kind of um, disease types, really. And we think about PCOS, you were talking about Greek and, um, you know, being Greek and, Middle and not Eastern. having that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Asian, Asian Middle, East, Middle Eastern, yeah, absolutely. And I think, is that environmental um, or is that something that's been passed down now because of the situation? Because we know as human beings, we can deal with famine a lot better, which is why fasting kind of really helps improve things. But well, well, the situation that's, we're in, the, that's the thing. Know. When someone's in a super hyper cortisol state and they come to me and they've got PCOS, I'm like, oh, maybe I should do this fast. I'm like, yeah, not yet. No, absolutely. Because if you can't stabilise your blood sugar with food, you're not going to stabilise it with a fast. No, I think that's it, isn't it? And these, these kind of drastic approaches to health as well that people are doing to, you know, because they've seen it on a forum and someone said, oh, I've regenerated my eggs by doing this. And, you know, I've, I've now followed a ketogenic diet and that's really helped um, my whole process. And I guess the premise behind that is, you know, the energy you know fat and producing that but if you've got issues with your gallbladder that's the last thing you want to do really isn't it ketogenic diet well yeah and also if you've got a ton of really like inflammatory like inf inflammation causing gram negative bacteria yeah um yeah i, I mean i have got to say that keto i like you know i do i do really subscribe to keto for some people and i did do the vegan yeah. keto for a while it's bloody hard well that's interesting <laughs> to isn't eat it's hard isn't it I mean, and i was I, like I don't contact really do noodles. for lots of people but i think if you are particularly overweight and your metabolism is so messed up that you need something to completely change it around 
then that might be good for a short time being but it's it's not something you can sustain as a woman long term um and i think no, i agree short bursts of things and then working in a healthful way all through those pathways and supporting it with herbs the right supplements the right diet looking at sleep hygiene as well because so many people with pcos also have you know real issues with their sleep as well and they have sleep apnea possibly because they're overweight as well if they or, are. also you see a lot of sleep apnea with women who have um low sorry not that it really necessarily rates of egos but um when your when your estrogen is low and your progesterone is low you've got low tissue integrity so the structure mm. collapses yeah. and there's also a big subset of women with very narrow jaws who get um sleep apnea but they're not being picked up which is why i always get people to send me their sleep data if they're wearing a tracker yeah these are amazing aren't they so to find out whether you know they're getting enough restorative deep sleep and also what's happening with their REM sleep as well you know yeah. that, that does change the... as you get older but it's really if it's a pattern for you biohacking I know both of us absolutely love doing I hate that phrase but it's all about understanding the body's mechanisms more and if you can do that and somebody has you know a lot of these things at hand you know they have something at home that tests their blood pressure their oxygen saturation they've got the heart rate variability and all those things it just makes our job so much more interesting and we can yeah. really delve into the details really and we start noticing patterns anyway yeah um, it's interesting about the sleep because one of the key, core things i've always learned in all my cancer fellowships and trainings has been if you don't fix the circadian rhythm you won't mm. get rid of the cancer properly like you really mm. need to sleep and wake up at the right times mm. um yeah. and like there's also rhythms in terms of like the course of the year their seasons and and this is also like a period of proliferation so february march april this is like when things are going to grow this is when things are going to kind of and mm. uh, um on a, on a neuroendocrine level things are going to start to shift in a potentially negative way yeah. you're going to see more growth on on inappropriate growth things like that so mm. this is the time where you really need to nip these things in the bud so it's a really good time to actually get get a handle on your health conditions yeah i guess that could be down to the fact that you're maybe laying down more fat um because you're not going out as much and you're eating more kind of you know thick carbohydrate type meals so but we're also not aligned with our circadian rhythm right yeah. now look at us we're sitting here we're, we're technically working well we are working yeah and it's dark and it went dark at what four or five o'clock today yeah, yeah we absolutely. should be in bed by seven <laughs> technically our ancestors did, didn't they? When they kind of worked the land, they were kind of, you know, having a meal and going home and being in bed. And I think you look at the animals that you have around you, they're getting up really early and, you know, people are getting annoyed. Oh, I know, my cats, cats are really, dogs. really, really <laughs> rinsing their lines at the moment. Oh, well, they normally Lazy. do. Lazy, they, they, they don't earn their keep. Well, that's because they're too chilled out. If you've got dogs, I think dogs' circadian rhythms are really good. Um, yeah. You know, they tend to kind of wake up and then if they chill out and relax, they do what they need to. The body goes, I need to rest, and they do, you know, and then they go, right, I'm ready to go now. And usually in the evenings, they're quite sedentary and, and sleeping a little. So, yeah, I think it's so interesting, isn't it, what we've kind of forced ourselves into in the modern life with all these electrics and, you know, yeah. these these strip lights and things in houses and offices um, and, you know, not kind of using the old old-fashioned kind of lamps that gave off less light and didn't kind of cause those problems and also you see kids with their ipads you know in the dark or on their phones I and know. it's literally lighting their whole face up so it's like it's kind of sucking their soul isn't it really uh, it's interesting because you know i've got patients who are just like the most model mums and um mm. and like basically i don't know what's happened i'm trying to get rid of this um can't see any of the um questions have disappeared okay there we go um so model mums kids are like have amazing sleep routines and everything sleep hygiene's perfect but because they're on instagram uh, not instagram they're on zoom all day for school now because it's like timetabled they're just their kids are getting like aggressive not sleeping yeah and they're like what am i doing what can i do and i'm like well we can give them some teas but we really need to like um you know, yeah, I've got that with my uh, nephew at the moment. He's 20 and he's obviously away from university at the moment and he's in a year doing nothing and he's up playing on his PlayStation till God knows what in the morning. 
you know, and then he's waking up at like one, two o'clock in the afternoon. So it's oh. hard. I think kids at this time around COVID and what's happening at the moment with the pandemic, they are filling their time with things that are upsetting their circadian rhythm a lot more. And I don't know whether that's going to have an effect on the fertility later on. I was well. about to say, I mean, I actually think just even carrying a mobile phone in your pocket next to your nether regions is going to have an effect on fertility. But I don't, yeah. I think the, the big problem is, is that this particular period, people have completely lost rhythm. I mean, some people have been yeah. really good and disciplined, but I'd mm -hmm. say most people, if you struggle with stress anyway, this has been a period where things probably yeah. have gone a little bit you know, off the rails. And I really think we're going to see significant impact from that in terms of people's hormones. Yeah, we certainly are. And I think it's interesting, even, you know, both of us are seeing that with patterns in people's cycles as well. You know, they've got oh, longer yes, absolutely. or shorter, much shorter because of the stress. And you, they say, does stress really do that? You know, can it affect you? And it, it does, you know, it affected my cycle when, you know, both my parents were in hospital, mine kind yeah. of extended. And, you know, I'm usually quite chilled and can kind of manage most things, but it does have a major effect on that because, you know, that communication system is so, so important. And if it doesn't happen, you know, there are changes to and repercussions in, in the body's natural reproductive cycle. Yeah, I, I had um, I had that one weird short one in 10 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was because I was drinking loads of ginger. Yeah, yeah, I've got some ginger. It didn't affect me that way, but it's... it's but, kind no, of, I mean, were you saying, drinking, like, serious amounts of ginger? Because I was, I was drinking a lot of pure I'm ginger having, juice. like, an ice cube tray of juiced ginger, like, every night with hot water. So I don't know how much that is. No, I drank, I drank a lot more than that. Did you? Um, so I, See, that's I, the other I, thing. People start doing things that they're told on the internet. Have ginger, it'll help reduce your pain for your periods. And then they're taking loads, you know, and you just you've got to be careful with all sorts haven't you and if you're quite an extreme personality and you do things all to the extreme again people don't see the fact that your cycle is a representation of what's happening yeah, in your mind I, I don't really agree well. with I don't really agree with taking painkillers I, I mean I would never I, I don't take them anyway regardless mm. but if I if I were, if I had a painful period I'd be thinking what's what's happened this month is it uh, am I under more stress um have I eaten more uh refined carbs or carbs at all um have i eaten, have i had less omega-3s i'd be thinking all of those things and then uh i'd be thinking right you know i need to sleep more this month i need to make sure that i exercise more rather than just going okay i'm just going to take it shouldn't be the norm to just take a paracetamol if i mean i would always suggest as well you know frankincense anyway but mm -hmm. i just don't think it should be the norm to be able to just pop a pill when you need to well it's the it's the kind of approach we've got to modern modern life isn't it turn something off turn it back on when we need it weird like i even as a as a teenager my approach was always like if i take a painkiller then i'm not going to know what's going on and i don't want mm. to because i just want to know what's going on what, how this is all going to pan out so even yeah. from a very early age you know when everyone at school was just mm. popping pills when going to the nurse and i was mm. like no i'm going to see what happens yeah well um, some people do need it if they've got really strong pain like it's stopping them from working but again you need to go and see somebody for that you know going on for nine years with the same kind of issue absolutely it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the definition of insane isn't it banging your head against the, the the brick wall and expecting a you know a different outcome and it's don't live with pain you know go and see somebody to try and work out what it is try your level best to work around that and take a painkiller if you do need it at the end of the day but it's it's just making sure you understand your body a lot more because i think we're we're absolutely you know not looking at who we are and understanding our bodies and i think i see this with clients you know we go through this cycle i ask them questions about the bowel movements their periods their sleep people yeah. have actually never asked them these questions before and they've gone oh this is interesting and they really start chatting about it and going yeah, you're probably right, actually. Um, yeah, that's probably not right. And, oh, I had no idea. And they get to know themselves a lot more. And that's the important thing, you know, because you're going to live in your body a lot longer than your fertility is going to be around. And that's about making sure you understand what your triggers are and what, what's important in terms of nourishing your body to get the best out of it. I just want to say some of the questions that are coming up. We're having questions about IVF and egg freezing and um, endometriosis. We're going to cover those in other weeks. 
Yes, we are. Um, We've got a lot to say, and this is kind of more about PCOS. Um, so the in conversations kind of side of things are going to be every Thursday, one Thursday a month. And we're first Thursday of the month. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of everything else that we were asked. So we talked about insulin, androgens. Oh, someone was asking about how to reduce like hair, like facial hair. Um, I, my favorite herb is like really simple. I use a lot of spearmint tea, but that's not mm. a fix all. You have to do that in conjunction with other. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's just also looking at other things as well. Um, you know, stress is a major factor. Massive. You're doing all these things like working with some herbs you're looking at maybe high levels of um, inositol if you've got issues with um, managing that and insulin and bringing down your testosterone, you know, working through some of these issues, but it's not just going to be a one thing that will fix it. If you have got mm. hair on your face, generally you might be more androgen based anyway. So it's a case of only reducing it down. It won't completely get rid of it. It's not, you know, going to be, wow, I can walk through, you know, and not have any issues with, hair on my face at all it's just going to make it a little bit softer but and also, also make your body work better there's the genetic element to that as well mm. some people just have more hair yeah absolutely and it could that be, doesn't mean know, that they have to worry about that hi kate <laughs> kate says hi girls yeah um yeah sorry uh yes i, I mean obviously Someone's talk, talking about how clients with endometriosis need painkillers initially. You know, whatever you do in your clinic, that's like totally your thing. Um, I would recommend patients go for frequency-specific microcurrent and do castor oil packs and do acupuncture and a bunch of other stuff uh, alongside you know, mm. the, the stuff I'm giving them. Because, yeah, you know, in the beginning, people are not going to necessarily stop taking painkillers. And I would never expect anyone to... I would never tell someone to do that. But what I find is that they need... You know, they, they realize they don't need them anymore. Because you yeah. say, so I remember one patient I had who was on eight paracetamol a day Ooh. for headaches. And, you know, I didn't ever say to her, you shouldn't take painkillers. But I did say, maybe we could try, like, doing some glutathione and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And, you know, I saw her a month or two later, and I was like, how's it going? She was like, I said, how many painkillers did you take this month? And it got to the point where she was like, oh, I haven't taken them. And I was like, well. Yeah, don't they? They go, oh, yeah, I forgot yeah. to take so it's actually a, a progression that happens with the patient anyway, quite naturally. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. It's I'm just, just gonna... you know, dependencies on other things change when you start to work with a client and, you know, work around some of their issues, because there may also be a, you know, an element of emotional attachment to certain yes. things, whether it's food, painkillers, you know, the situation. And it's it's just so interesting working with a client and understanding their life and what's going on around them um, and trying to support some of their issues with fertility with PCOS um, with that family situation and also you know trying to understand what what this means for them if you know things start to work well as well oh actually there was one other thing about alcohol someone's asking if there was ever any 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 um, case where you would like be able to drink on, and have PCOS and get rid of it and I'm like I mean I don't really recommend it well it just brings up um testosterone you know even with people who don't have high levels so every time you drink why do you think people are so aggressive when they drink why it's like your gut bacteria you know causes inflammation yeah. like why why it's like pouring water in a bucket with holes in the bottom it yeah. might fill up slightly but it's not going to Fill up. Yeah. I think people sometimes use alcohol to relax and that's an interesting thing isn't it because if they're stressed and they're working too hard we need to work on the other side before we actually go let's use um, downers to make you re reduce your stress in the evening because you're working too hard and take away the caffeine to boost you up because you're so knackered you've worked till you know eight or nine o'clock at night you need something in the morning to boost you so we kind of live in a, in a culture and an environment where we kind of you know we're using things to boost and, you know, to, to lower things because naturally we, we need to do the work on the middle bit, don't we, in terms of, you know, what our, our lifestyle says about us, really. I've got to say, I, I love coffee. Um, and, what, and I remember <laughs> what... I, I love coffee too. 
but I also think it's good you know you should have it as a as a kind of post meal 20 to yeah. 30 minutes after meal um you know and I, I always add stuff to mine you know unless what I'm do you going... reckon to uh the whole bulletproof kind of coconut fatty coffee thing I mean sometimes I add MCT but because I have the APOE4 and a bunch of other things I don't really go for coconut oil in my life yeah but I make it for my husband in the mornings. Yeah, I mean it's quite delicious, but I okay. it all, you've all you've always got to look at whether you break down fat, you know. And if you've done done your your research around that person, um, you know, they might be somebody that uses the fat and it helps them because they're quite a hyper person and they they may have low dopamine and they're using the coffee for that reason as well. Well, then I would give them macuna in it or give them macuna, but then that could potentially raise testosterone. So you would be very careful yeah. about these. Herbs. So everyone's talking about adaptogens and like, oh yeah, this one's great. But they're like, you know, I wouldn't use ashwagandha with someone who needed to potentially lose weight because it can be quite building. At the same time, yeah. it's very good for, for thyroid conversion. Um, macuna is great. Again, I, it's one of my mm. favorite herbs and I take it most days in my, in my coffee. Um, but it's not appropriate for someone who has high mm. testosterone. No, God, no. It increases it. You know, I've got quite low testosterone at the moment. And but I why? Um, so it's all these things that, you know, boost that up. And if you've got PCOS and you're more androgen dominant, you wouldn't go there with that because that, you know, may just tip you over the edge on that side. And who knows when your testosterone increases. What, what, you know, what that that that's is amazing, though. Eh? Yeah, that's true. That's good for energy, isn't it? But if oh. you take that and you, you're already a little bit wired... Um, you balance that, it out with other, other herbs, but it's particularly yeah, good for egg. You're all about the kind of, you know, magicians... Harmonising. But cordyceps <laughs> is very good for egg quality. Yeah. So yeah and I'd also always... very good for sperm um, quality as well. And if people have got issues with motility as well, cordyceps are brilliant for that because you know, it will help them go a little bit further if motility is an issue. We haven't really talked about the guys, have we? It's more, we'll talk, more about we are going to talk about the men, don't we worry. We will. We will do male fertility and some of the same questions really around lifestyle, supplements, herbs, and all those kind of things. But I guess we've gone over a little bit, as we always do, Carolina, when we mm -hmm. chat, um, generally. But it's um, it's been so good to kind of, you know, work through what we do and how we do things together. And we work together quite a lot in terms of, clients and you know i'm always asking you advice on certain herbs but i again as a nutritional therapist i'm very conscious of the fact that herbs are so important you know they're the function of all all kind of pharmaceutical drugs so make yeah. sure you get somebody who knows their stuff as a herbalist and don't just kind of willy-nilly go ahead with adaptogens and things that help your liver because you think that's going to help them around lots of their issues with PCOS or thyroid issues or whatever. Just be careful with things like that. And, and you know, dabbling is, is one of the worst things you can do because I think we're often pulling people back and pulling the reins back from people are going, oh, I've been using this for years. And, you know, we're sort of like, mm, we need but to, you know, I've make sure say, we don't. Even an ositol for some people is not appropriate. No, it drops the blood sugar too low. So if you haven't got issues with, um, you know, insulin and that is driving that whole issue with you, it can give you headaches, it can actually mm. drop your blood sugar too low. So I wouldn't always go in with a high dose on those trials of say four grams of inositol because those are specifically around trials that have been working with women who had classic PCOS where they were overweight and, and they had you know, um, anovulatory cycles um, and they were going for IVF. So you know, nutritional therapists generally always go, oh, inositol for PCOS. Be oh, damn yeah. careful with that because you can drop the blood sugar so low that they become, you know, problematic with, you know, managing everything else. And it can give people horrendous headaches and all sorts of things. So like everything, start off slowly, build up if that's something you think would be useful for them. Don't go in there with a the huge whack of things because the trial said you need to have that. Don't worry, it's going to be saved on uh, both of our IGTV things. <laughs> but does it save on mine as well? I am a total Luddite when it I'm comes not to sure. It. I'll send it to you if it doesn't. I Good. have to agree. Okay, because I, I, this is my first, well, it's not my first live, but it's, it's, you know, I haven't done one for a while, so I'm kind of getting back into it again. It's good. It's good. I think it's really important to just raise the kind of, to, to even flag the questions that most people don't think about. So, yeah. Um, and just being able to kind of 
nudge people in the right direction. I find it really, it's like, I don't know. I've been doing lives every week for a few weeks. Now. Yeah, you've been good. Thing. You've been good. I've been hibernating for a while, trying to get things sorted on my end. So. I've been hibernating for years and I just, <laughs> I, just I hate social media, as you know. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So, social crack, as I like to call it. <laughs> I, know, I just, if I could have my way. I mean, this is the thing. I just don't find it very... Uh, good for your mental health so I just no I mean them. that's what I'm worried about long term for people who are using this because you know if they've got low dopamine and they're using it to kind of support that it upsets your circadian rhythm you know you can yeah. ride the crest of the wave with your sleep if you're feeling sleepy around 10 p.m and you start going on your your ipad or your phone you can be up till 2 a.m in the morning and not tired you know and that's um, completely upset your rhythms and that is such an important thing to get right for your fertility and people actually don't think it's that important. They do everything else. They say, oh, no, it's my me time. You know, I have time to myself and I go on my laptop or I go on this and, you know. But we just, people, most people, I think, who are working from home have now saved some time commuting. I mean, I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've still got to get home, do my little walk back to the car, uh, dodging, dodging quite scary crackheads. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the crack foxes. <laughs> it's, it's bad at the moment on Brick Lane. Um, oh no, I know. I worry about you walking down there. Actually, it's all right. I've got my keys in my hand, ready, ready to strike. Cast if I need rod, to. You? just in case. <laughs> but um, yeah, circadian rhythm. I always like energetically, and you know, Chinese medicine, endogenic medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, it all says the same thing. You need to be in bed before midnight. Yeah. And like, ideally, you need your restorative sleep between six and eight a.m. So, I mean, that doesn't really tie in with any of the the, the light exposure stuff. No, it but, doesn't. It doesn't. You know. But I think that's something we can all aim for: is at least going to bed by eleven or ten. Yeah. Um, yeah. As someone who comes from you know a Greek family where people in Cyprus rock up for tea and cake at like midnight. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? Hard. Especially if you've got a family as well, because my family are all night owls, you know. Yeah, I'm a night owl. And, I'm, I'm really... and me too. We're, we're often kind of, you know, talking to each other late. And I think sometimes that can be a problem, can't it? Kind of well, cutting out. Well, now I ignore my phone. Habits. I ignore my phone and I get, you know, I don't open my work emails after a certain yeah. time. And I... I actually go to bed when I get that first wave of, little, you know, that little yeah. inkling of tiredness. I'm like, all right, I'm going to have my shower and go to bed now. Yeah, so... that's a good idea, definitely. So yeah, this was nice. Um, it was very nice. It was. It was, it was good to kind of chat, and I think it's always good when you know somebody to kind of talk through things that you both feel passionate about, and try and help people understand the way we work as practitioners, and yeah. how as a client would come to you, and what you would do. You know, because often we don't see these things on on Instagram lives. We just see you know things happening around certain specific topics, but. It's good to know if you were a client, what you would sort of get if you came to see somebody. Or rather what you should expect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what, um, what you should be getting. Um, yeah, you need a thorough investigation. That's the main thing. You need someone to really yeah. carefully consider your case. Um, should we do endometriosis on the next one? Yeah, let's do endometriosis. That sounds like a good one to do. Right. And uh, maybe we'll follow that up with some other things if people have got specific topics they want us to cover in conversation um please let either myself or carolina know and we'll we will do our best to kind of put some things together around that yeah i think it's it's good to be able to have like clinical kind of focused conversations yes oh well i'm going to go home now <laughs> dodge the crack box dodge the crack um, it's along the route <laughs> and like we and, can have uh, an, we can have yeah. uh, i'll speak to you later absolutely thank you everyone for joining us it's been yeah really thanks cool so much have... everyone and thanks for the great questions yeah thank you it's always nice oh yeah we'll do fibroids as well don't worry <laughs> we will Got loads of things in in the back pocket so don't yes. worry about cool all right i'm gonna figure out how to turn this off now oh. <laughs> such a luddite okay i think it's it. me too uh no that's wrong okay how how do i turn off i've man i managed to do it before Oh, I don't know. It doesn't work on my end, so I'm leaving it to you. I'm so lazy. You've set this oh, all up. Oh, here we go. I'm going to end it. I'll all see right. you later. Bye. Bye.